Amen. Amen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Blessings. Thank God for another beautiful day. Thank God for another study of his word. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity. We've all been growing and learning on a weekly basis uh, through this discipleship book. It's a very powerful book. And I'm just um, grateful for the opportunity to go through this book and, and help us to understand more of, of who we are and what God has called us to be and to do, even in the earth. And so we have an exciting lesson on tonight, this afternoon rather, and uh, we're in chapter 14 of our uh, Foundations of Truth by Derek Prince, Foundations of Truth by Derek Prince, and uh, we're in chapter 14, and we're going to be dealing with the law, and we're going to deal with grace, law and grace. This is very, very important that we understand um, there is a difference in who the law was for. We're going to go through a lot of this. And so thank God for all of those. I see some of our people jumping on. As I always say, um, please be patient with me. I will um, expound on um, our teaching. If you do not have a manual, I will expound on our teaching. You can ask questions. Please don't hesitate. This is a very, very... Um, Good lesson on tonight because there are a lot of people in the body of Christ that are still struggling when it comes to uh, the distinction or the understanding of the law and understanding of grace. There's a lot of people that struggles with this even right now. And so we're going to get into this lesson. I'm going to just open up with prayer. I see you all jumping on. Um, I'm going to open up with prayer and then we're going to transition into this um, study on tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord God, for life, health, and strength. Thank you, for Lord God, for allowing us to see another day. We just pray right now in the name of the Lord Jesus that you just, you know, renew our minds, renew our hearts, bring our minds closer to you, help us to tune into you, into your word. Give us an ear to hear what you have to say. We even pray right now, Father God, that you forgive us for our sins and purify our minds and our hearts, Lord God, that we may think like you, may be, we act like you in the earth, Father God, or we will represent the kingdom in the earth. We thank you for everything that you've done, everything that you're going to do today, Father God. We we just give you all praise, glory, and honor. We thank you for this lesson. We pray, Father God, that through this lesson, um, we get an understanding of the law, get an understanding of grace, get an understanding of your truth, Father God, through your word, through this study. And we're thankful for those who are watching live, and we're thankful for those who are, who are physically here, praying, Father God, that you get the glory out of those who their heart and mind is focused on you on this afternoon. Any things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, our teaching on tonight is dealing with the law and grace. And we have to understand that it's two different dispensations. Two different dispensations. The dis dispensation, which we're going to find out in our study um, of the law, we, we know that Moses, God used Moses. The, Moses the, the law came through Moses. And we're in a dispensation of grace. When we say dispensation, we're talking about time, okay? We're no longer under the law. We have to understand, I'm doing this so we can get up. If you have questions, um, feel free to ask. But the law was for the Jews, okay? It was not for the Christians. Everything that is Jewish is not Christian, okay? The first time you hear Christians is, is, is within a new church age. All right, now we do have Jewish Christians. Jewish Christians. There are Jews, but they are born again believers. But where I'm going with this is that the law was for the Jews. Anybody outside or that they call Gentiles, any outside, anybody outside the Jews, if they wanted to be a Jew or be a part or follow the law, they had to be circumcised. Circumcision, that was part of the covenant, okay? We deal with circumcision of the flesh, the foreskin in the Old Testament. That was the covenant established with Abraham. Now we deal with the circumcision of the heart. Okay? So we see in the dispensation of the law, we deal with circumcision of the flesh, the actual foreskin. And then in the New Testament, we deal with uh, circumcision of the heart. So there's a difference. We talk, I did a teaching on grace. Grace means unmerited favor. Grace is a gift. Okay, you didn't earn it. You didn't do anything to 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 work for it. All right, but we're in two different dispensations, and there are a lot of believers today, right now, and what you're going to find out in this study, 
you can find out in the scripture that are trying to keep the law. Okay? We cannot, one, the law wasn't for us, and then two, even the Jews who the law was for could not keep the law. Okay? They could not keep it. We find out Jesus comes on the scene. He says, I ain't come to destroy it, but I came to fulfill it. So he fulfilled the law because he was perfect. He had no sin. Okay? And a lot of the confrontation that Jesus has with the, the religious leaders is the fact that it was the man-made part that they added to the law. Okay? It wasn't the law in itself that uh, Jesus was having the confrontation with the religious leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees. It was the fact of what they added to the law, okay? And they had a lot of man-made stuff that was added, and they tried to um, put it on the Jews, okay? And so that's the reason why Jesus had so much confrontation. But we need to understand these, these, these small things that, um, that the law was for the Jews, it wasn't for Christians. Um, when we deal with um, the keys, and, and he, he tells, Jesus tells Peter, you have the authority to bind and to loose. Okay, this was something that they did not permit the Gentiles to do, which was to follow the law. Okay, all right? You will see this all in the New Testament. All right, they did not permit them. Okay, so they bind them. They didn't permit it. That's what binding and loosing is, to permit or not to permit, or to allow and not to allow. So as we get into our manual, chapter 14, uh, page 121 in our manuals, I wanted to open up that way to kind of get some of this, I want to say preliminary stuff out the way. It may sound somewhat repetitive, uh, but we, we do, and I just told Pastor Bill, you know, and to uh, Brother Sean as well, that we have the Hebrew Israelites. We have a lot of them. I'm not afraid to talk about it. They, they try to, their Old Testament base, they try to follow the law, and they claim themselves as the chosen ones and all this. And, and the reality of it is, if the Jews of that day and time could not keep the law, and we're going to find out in the teaching, even in us in this day and time, we couldn't keep the law. Okay? If the Jews couldn't keep it, and the law was for them, we ourselves can't keep it. So that's why Jesus had to fulfill it. Okay? And so there's three parts of the law. It's the ceremonial, the moral, and I believe it's the civil. The ceremonial part of it, we no longer go do. We no longer go with the ceremonial part of the law. That means the washing of your hands and you got to let your hands drip this way and all that kind of stuff. All of the things of not eat, don't eat this, and that, all that extra stuff that was a part of the ceremonial part of law, we don't, we don't, that part has been, the proper word I'm trying to get, um, it's been done away with. Okay, we still have to uh, abide by the more. The more is how you live, according to the word of God. The word of God is a guide and shows us how to live according to the word of God, so that we go by. So I want to touch, just touch on those things, um, just because it gives us a preliminary of what's going on, but if you have questions, because there are believers right now that are struggling with, you know, do I obey the law? The law is the word of God. And Jesus simplified and said, listen, if you can love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself, he says, you can fulfill the law. And so now through Christ, we, as Christ has fulfilled it, we have fulfilled it because we're in him and he abides in us. Okay? All right. So here in our manual, if you have any questions, I see a lot of people on live. If you have any questions, I am trying to break it down as simply as I possibly can because of so much of the controversy of the law and grace. And um, there's a lot of people that still think we got to go by this law and they don't understand that, you know, now that Christ has fulfilled the law, he's done all that he's done for us. We don't go by the law. We go, we're in a dispensation of grace. And we are to obey the word of law. The Bible tells us if we're led by the spirit, we don't need the law. Because the Holy Spirit is going to lead us. We're, we're made right. The Holy Spirit is going to lead us on the right path. The law is for those who don't uh, 
for the lawbreakers, those who don't follow rules. Okay, the law, only thing the law did, if I can say it this way, was to show you what you did wrong. It couldn't save you. The law could not save you. That's why they had to go through um, the sacrifices yearly, had to offer sacrifices. The priest himself had to offer sacrifice for himself. And the blood of goats and all of that did not wash away our sins. Okay? So I want to touch on these things as we get into it. Because you'll see everything that I've said is in the scripture. You would read it in the book of Romans between chapter 6, chapter 7. Might even be chapter 8. You can read these chapters. Even I think even chapter 5. Um, you can get into the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews talk about um, Moses and Jesus and and that we, we serve a much greater high priest. Now, Moses was great. He was awesome. But there's one greater, which is Christ. So, there, you know, there's so much. Um, as the Holy Spirit has given it to me, I'm just letting it uh, flow. So what we need to know on page 121, chapter 14, the second verse here in this paragraph says, Salvation received through faith alone. Faith in Christ finished work of atonement without human works of any kind. That means we ourselves did not do this work. We were not qualified to die on the cross. It had to be an ultimate sacrifice. Christ was that ultimate sacrifice. And salvation is received by faith alone. It's by faith that you believe. And I, and I just did this teaching with my mom. We was going through Colossians, the third chapter. And it says, if you be risen with Christ... And, and, and it deals with the baptism. The baptism is symbolic of the old man, symbolic of Christ's death and his resurrection. Okay? So by faith, we are saved. All right? And it says faith in Christ's finished work of atonement. All right? He finished everything. He, don't, he, he can no longer go back and do it again. When Christ died, he died once and for all. Okay? And without human works. Let's drop down uh, on page 121, the, maybe one, two, the third paragraph. It says, the answer of the New Testament is clear and consistent. Once, once a person has trusted Christ for salvation, his righteousness no longer depends on observing the law of Moses, either wholly or in part. Okay? So, your righteousness... As it says here, it no longer depends on observing the law. They struggle with it. They themselves could not be righteous because they couldn't keep it. Okay? So it's telling us here that once we put our trust in Christ for, for salvation, his righteousness no longer depends upon observing the law. My righteousness is I'm righteous because he made me righteous. Because of what Christ did on the cross, I am righteous. Because of what Christ did on the cross, um, he's given me grace, all right? There's so much that happened because of what Christ did on the cross. Now that he shed his blood, all of my sins are washed away, okay? So it's these little simple preliminary things um, we need to know. The next section is the law of Moses, one single complete system. If we look at John 1 and 17, it says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Okay? The law came through Moses. Now, this goes all the way back to there was no law during the time of Adam. Everything was perfect. All God gave Adam, which we'll find out in, in, in a few minutes, that he gave him one commandment. Okay? He was to follow that commandment. He disobeyed comm that commandment then sin came into the world by one man's sin. The scripture even tells about one man's sin, uh, sin came into the world, but by one man, which is Christ, we're all been cleansed. We've all been redeemed by that one man, which is Jesus, because he had to shed his blood. Okay? But it's only through accepting him. If you don't accept Christ, guess what? You're still under the bondage of sin. Okay? Which leads to death. But it says here in the next program, notice the phrase, the law was given through Moses, not some laws or part of law, but the law, the whole law, 
the complete entire one system was given at one period in history through the human instrumental of one man only, and that man was Moses. So he was the one that led the children of Israel. That one man that God chose, um, that the law came through. Let's turn to page 122. And we have a scripture right there, 5, Romans, the 5th chapter, verses 13 through 14. Watch this. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin not imputed when there was no law. In other words, there was no law at the beginning. But when sin came into the place, then a law was established by God. This is what it's saying. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. So between the time of Adam and Moses, no law was established. But sin came into humanity because of one man's sin. Okay? Even over those who have not sinned according to the likeness of of the transgression of Adam. So we were born into sin because of one man's sin, because of one man's disobedience. We were born into it. But Christ, he redeemed us. He shed his blood. Through his blood, we've been redeemed. But we only experience the full, I guess, the fullment of um, the redemption is through by faith. You have to believe in him by faith. Let's go to the next scripture, Genesis 3, 1 through 3. He says, this was the instruction that was given to him. He said, you should not eat the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden. This was the command. It wasn't a law, but it was the command that he gave Adam. And all he had to do was obey. Nothing happened when Eve ate. Okay? It happened because he gave Adam the command. So if Adam would have followed God's command... We wouldn't be jacked up. Okay? He was the first Adam. Jesus is the second Adam. Okay? So we thank God for the second Adam. Because without him, we would not be here. Next paragraph says, When Adam transgressed, that means he went against the commandment of God, sin entered into human race and came upon Adam and all of the descendants from that time onward. Okay? Because of Adam. Anybody from the time of Adam's sin and, and on were born into sin onward. It says the evidence that sin came upon all men from, from the time of Adam onward is the fact that all men became liable to death, which is the outcome of sin. For the wages of sin is death. There is no life in sin. Okay? There is no life in it. Next paragraph, for however, from the time that Adam transgressed against the first single God-given command unto the time of Moses, there was no God-given, God-enforced system of, of the law revealed and applied to the human race. Okay? There was no law in place. The law did not come until Moses came on the scene. Okay? Drop down to the last little paragraph before that little scripture. It says, during this time, the human race was without any system of God-given, God-enforced law. This is in the full accord with the statement already quoted from John 1.17. The law was given through Moses. This law, so given, was a single, complete system of commandments, statutes, ordinance, and judgments. So you see this, these words. Statutes, ordinance, judgment, it all applies to the law. Okay? And they all contain in the entire entirety with the compass of the four books of the Bible. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then we know that Moses wrote the first five books. Penta means five. Tuch means books. Pentateuch, first five books. Okay? That's what that means. All right. It says, before the time of Moses, there was no divine system of the law given to human race. Furthermore, after the close of this period, nothing further was even added to the system of the law. That the law was thus given once for all, complete, and is made plain by the words of Moses. This is when he gave it. Watch this. 
Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live, and go and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you. You should not add to the word which I command you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of your God, which I command you. And that's Deuteronomy 4, 1 and 2. So he gives them this law. He gives them that you must follow this law that's being established by God. And we know the whole story where Moses goes to the mountain, he spends time with God, he writes the commandments. God speaks to him because Moses took so long and the people of God got frustrated and made two golden calves. He came down and he broke the commandments out of frustration. So then you'll find out, I believe it's Deuteronomy the 10th chapter, where he rewrites it, okay? And so, and then he presents it again, all right? Let's drop to page 123. The last little paragraph, it says, Any person who comes under the law is necessarily obligated to keep the whole law at all times. Okay? So you can't just obey some of the law. You can't obey just a part of it. We're going to find out <coughs> that when you disobey one part of the law, you disobey the whole law. Okay, we're going to find that out because they couldn't keep the law. So when they, if they transgress against one part of the law, you transgress against the whole law. All right, this was a struggle of them. They couldn't keep it. All right, they could not keep it. So thank God that we're not under the law. The law showed you your penalty. The law showed you your judgment. Okay, which was death. All right? Ultimately, your judgment was death. And it tells you right here, James, the second chapter 10 and 11, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you, but you do murder, then you have transgressed the whole law. Okay? We have to make it plain because there are people right now trying to live by the law. And they don't understand that murder or adultery is just not the actual act. It starts with the heart. That's why in the New Testament it talks about circumcision of the heart. Because the heart is a sinful place. It's a lot of evil stuff that's in your heart. Okay? And so we think because we think that I'm okay because I didn't act it out. No. Your desire is the sin starts in the heart. And what happens is, if you don't stop it there, eventually it comes out in actions. I think James said it. He said, you know, don't blame God when you're tempted. God himself can't be tempted. But you're led away by your, 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 your fleshly desires. That starts in the heart. Your desire starts in the heart. Adultery starts in the heart. If you are married, or let's use this and that. Yeah, if you're married and you desire to have, if you if you desire another woman, you're married, you committed adultery. But we don't want to deal with it like that. If 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 you uh, hate somebody to the degree, now you didn't go to actually act out and kill them, but in your heart, you already plotting, you've already committed the sin. I think Jesus, God told Abel, Cain, yeah, Cain, he says, sin creepeth at the door. What do you mean, the door of what? Your heart. He says, sin is right there. Cain had an opportunity to not commit that sin, but he allowed that sin. He, a matter of fact, to be real, Abel was already dead before the act because it, it was already made up in his mind and his heart that he was going to do it. He just followed through with it. Okay? So sin starts in the heart. So if sin starts in the heart, then I need to repent before I actually fulfill the actions. Because the actions 
the repercussions could be so much greater. What do I mean? If you really commit murder, then you can experience a life prison. You can experience death. So much stuff can come out of it. But if, if, if you can repent before, before the actions come, then that's good. God, you know, God, he's going to forgive you either way because he's a forgiving God. You, you may have to serve the consequences of what you've done. But to avoid those other consequences, just repent. All right? So I wanted to make that clear. Because we try to overlook stuff like that. And God knows the heart. I may not see your heart, but God sees your heart. Okay? So, the next paragraph right underneath that scripture on page 123 for those who have the manual. This both clear and logical. A person cannot say, I consider certain points of the law to be important. So I will observe these. But I consider certain other points of the law to be unimportant, unimportant, so I will not uh, uh, observe those. When it comes to the law, you couldn't do that. You had to obey the whole law. Let's make this more applicable to us today. It's the same thing with the word of God. You can't just pick this scripture and say, I'm going to obey this scripture and not obey that scripture. It's the same concept. And that's what we have some believers that do that. Well, I, I like the New Testament over the Old Testament, so I'm going to obey all the, Old, all the New Testament scriptures. Well, there are still scriptures in the Old Testament that still plot today. Okay? Vice versa. Well, I, you know, I just like the Old Testament. I, I don't like the New Testament, and, and I don't want to obey still. You have to obey. The, the Bible says eat the whole roll. You got to eat everything. You can't pick and choose when you're going to be obedient, when you're not going to be obedient. Okay, we have to make this clear because we have people today that want to pick and choose when they're going, you know, what part of the word they're going to obey. And the law, there were so many laws. I think it was 600 or something about that. You know, it's just, just stuff you, you know, um, Stuff that may, you know, you consider it unclean, all kind of stuff. And they couldn't keep that. They couldn't. So that's why we thank God for grace. I'm not going to get too much into that because there's so much dealing with the law. All right? But it applies the same thing to the Word of God. We've got to obey the whole Word of God. And I, I thank God that we're under grace. Let's look at the last, uh, on page 123, let's look at the last scripture. Watch this. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. That you're cursed. If you're still trying to keep the law, you're cursed. You're cursing yourself. Because, as I said, the Jews couldn't keep it. So if you Trying to keep the law, you, you, you bring a curse upon yourself. Because it says you have to obey the whole law. You violate one, you violate everything. So that's why you thank God for the grace. Page 124 the top. Notice the phrase, continue in all things. This indicates that a person who is under the law must observe the whole law at all times. A person at any time breaks any point of the law has transgressed the whole law and has thus come under divine curse pronounced under all transgressions of the law. Okay? In the bold print on page 124, the whole law must be accepted and applied complete and entire as a single system or else it has no benefit or validity whatsoever, or whatever. So let's look at this next paragraph. Following from this, we come to a third important point that must be recognized in the connection with the law. And this is a matter of actual historical fact. The system of the law given by Moses was ordained by God solely for one small section of the human race. That human race was the Jews. This was who he chose. That 
that was the people of Israel after their deliverance from the bondage of Egypt. Now here in the Bible, is there any suggestion that God has ever intended that the Gentiles, either nationally or individually, should observe the law of Moses, either wholly or in part, the entire, the entire law or in part? The only exception to this is found in the case of a few Gentiles who voluntarily decided to associate themselves with Israel. And you'll read it, this, I think it's in, I want to say it's in Deuteronomy possibly, but there were some that were Gentiles. And the instruction was given to Moses that they could not partake or be a part. But if they wanted to, they had to be circumcised. That's what I opened up with. And by them being circumcised, then they was able to partake or to be a part of any of the festivals, anything that, that was going on. But by them being circumcised, now they were also had to follow according to the law of God. Because it was the circumcision of the flesh to, uh, that was established with Abraham that was part of the covenant. So now any Gentile in the Old Testament became part of the covenant, covenant through circumcision. That was the only way you can do it. Okay? So let's look at the bottom of page 124, the three um, highlight uh, points right here. It says the law was given once for all as a single complete system through Moses. Thereafter, nothing could ever be added to it or taken away. So once, this mo once uh, the law was established, nothing could be added or taken away. Okay, you can't add to the word of God today. You can't, you can't make the word of God say what you want it to say. I think I said that on Sunday. You know, you can't put your psyche into the text. You can't make the text say what you want to say. You can't make the scripture because of how you feel. You know, you got some, you got some teachers or some preachers, you know, they want to try to attack somebody through the scripture, somebody in the body. And, you know, they, they come in and, and they try to use the scriptures against them. Listen. You can't start making the scripture say what you want them to say. No, you have to study to get an understanding and to get the interpretation of what the scripture is saying. Okay? Just trying to help us because you, are, you, you, are be a, you, you can allow your emotions to interpret the scripture because of based on how you feel. You can't do that. You got to study. You got to study the words in the text because different words mean different things in the text. And if you, if you don't study, then you can get a misinterpretation of the scripture. All right? So we can't add to the word of God. Can't take away from the word of God. All right? Watch this. Number two says, the law must also be observed in entirely as a single complete system. To break any one point of the law is to break the whole law. Last one. As a matter of human history, this system of the law was never ordained by God for Gentiles. It was for the Jews only. The law was for the Jews. Okay? Now, I'm not attacking, but you Hebrew Israelites, if you still feel that you are the chosen one, and you still want to hold on to the Old Testament, the law is for you if you think you are the chosen one. But you got to keep the whole law. You got to keep the whole law. And, and it clearly tells you that you are cursed. Okay, let's turn to page 125. Christians are not under the law. There's a difference from Jews and Christians. You don't see Christians into the new church age. Okay? You don't see it into the new church age. We got to know the difference. Let's look at the scripture on page 125, Romans 6 and 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Okay? We're not under the law, but under grace. 
Let me read that again. So, and we're going to get into the sin. It don't have dominion over us. As long as I'm under grace, if I'm trying to follow the law, then I'm going to be condemned because all the, all the law did is show me what I did wrong. That's what the law did. It showed me what I did wrong. The law could not save me. It tells us on page 125, this verse reveals two important truths. First, Christian believers are not under the law, but under grace. These are two alternatives that mutually exclude each other. A person who is under grace is not under the law. No one, no person can be under both the law and grace at the same time. It's either you're going to follow the law or you're going to follow the grace. Can't, you can't straddle the fence with it. Christians are not under the law. The law was for the Jews. It repeatedly tells us this. Okay? Second, the very reason why sin shall not have dominion over Christians, believers, is because they are not under the law. We wasn't under the law. I just opened up and I talked about how um, we have some Gentiles and, and we talked about binding and loosing, which deals with permit and not permit. That the Gentiles was not permitted to follow the law. Okay? Now that they became born again, they didn't have to go under the law. All right? The law has been fulfilled. So as long as a person is under the law, he is under the dominion of sin. To escape from dominion of sin, a person has to come out from under the law. Okay? It's so the only way you can come out from sin. You have to come out from underneath the law because the law, your judgment was death. It tells us here in the next verse, the sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. The law strengthens sin. It showed you what you did wrong. You can never get away from what you did because the blood of, of goats and so on and so forth didn't wash away your sins, but it was done as a, a way of remembering. So those, those sacrifices didn't wash away your sins. But the sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. So the law was, sin was strengthened by the law. That's why we thank God for grace. Next paragraph says this. The law actually strengthened dominion of sin over those who are under the law. The harder, watch this, the harder they strive to keep the law, the more conscious they became of the power of sin within themselves. So sin, because the law could not wash away your sins, it showed you your sin, and consciously, they couldn't, it, it would, it, they couldn't erase it off their conscience. That means if they transgressed against the law of God, the law of God showed them the sin, showed them their penalty. And consciously, they couldn't get it out of their heads because of how the law was set up. So it says, the more conscious they become of the power of sin within themselves, exercising dominion over them, even against their own will, and frustrating every attempt to live by the law, the only escape from the dominion of sin is to come out from under the law and to come under grace. That's the only way. That's why we thank God for grace. The unmerited favor. You didn't work for this. God is gracious towards us. When we should be condemned, there is no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus that walk that does not walk after the flesh but after the spirit. Okay? As long as I'm obedient to the leading of the spirit, spirit the Holy Ghost, I don't need the law because the Holy Ghost is going to obey the word of God and it's going to lead us in obedience. So I don't need the law now because I got the Holy Ghost. So why are you trying to obey the law and the Holy Ghost is going to align itself with God and the word of God? The law was for those who are disobedient. I don't need the law now because I got the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost is my teacher. The Holy Ghost is my revealer. 
Romans, the, the last, uh, on page 125, the last uh, scripture. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, which were aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit of death. For the wages of sin is death. Okay? But now we have been delivered from the law. I've been set free. How do you know I'm set free? Because Christ fulfilled the law. So I'm set free. Having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. The letter, oldness of the letter is the old law. Okay? The newness of the spirit. I've been renewed by the spirit of God. We've been delivered from the law. The old man has died. There's a newness about us. Let's turn to page 126. I pray that those who are watching that don't have the manual, I pray that you're getting something on tonight. I am trying to break it down um, as much as I possibly can about the law, the difference between law and grace. Um, I'm, I'm trying my best to make sure because I know you all don't have the manual. So I'm trying to break it down. But this scripture, watch this, page 126, maybe the first second, the third sentence down. Christian believers, we have been delivered from the law that we should serve God, not according to the letter of the law, which is the ordinance, the statutes, but in the newness of the spirit of life that we receive through the faith in Christ. So by faith, the, I, as Christ has fulfilled the law, by faith I have fulfilled the law. Because I fulfilled through the Holy Ghost, but in Christ. Christ fulfilled the law. So now, because I'm in Christ, I fulfilled the law. The Holy Ghost gives me the ability now to do what I didn't have the ability to do before. That's why I said I gave you two greatest commandments to love thy neighbor. Love that God with all our heart, mind, soul. Love that neighbor as thyself. If Jesus said, it, if you can do these two, you fulfill the law. So the Holy Ghost gives me the ability, even though I'm not under the law, to fulfill it through the obedience. I'm able to fulfill it by doing those two things. Here's the scripture, Romans 10 and 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Us trying to be righteous by keeping the law. The Jews try to be righteous by keeping the law. And they couldn't uh, keep it, so then they wasn't righteous. And then their sacrifices didn't help because it didn't wash away. But it says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So now that I believe in Christ, I'm made righteous. And I don't have to do it through trying to fulfill the law. I did it by faith, and now I'm made righteous. Skip the next paragraph. Next paragraph underneath where it says the believer's righteousness. The believer's righteousness, on page 126 for those who had a manual. The believer's righteousness is no longer derived from keeping of all the law, either holy or part, but solely from faith in Christ. So my righteousness has nothing to do with the law now. Okay? Paul states that the law as a means of righteousness came to an end when the atoning death of Christ upon the cross. When you think atone, it means amend. Amend means remove faults. He removed our faults. Without shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So without his blood being shed, then our sins are not washed away. Okay? When we think, we say trespass, we're dealing with violation, going against the law of God. The scripture says here, and, and you being dead in your trespasses, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him. We have become alive in Christ. If you be risen in Christ, you are alive. 
Same spirit that resurrected Jesus, same spirit that resurrected us. Have forgiven you all of your violations against God, all of your trespasses, and have wiped out the handwritten of requirements that was against us. That these statues and the different parts of the law, uh, what it, how did it say it? It said the statues, and there's a couple a couple other things. Um, oh, it'll come to me. But there were just certain requirements of the law that you had to follow through. Whatever the law was, they had an action that you had to go through with. So not only did you have to obey the law, you had to follow through with the actions according to that law. Okay, the ordinances, the statutes, all that. Um, so whatever the law was, you had to follow through. So if it says thou shalt not kill, now you got to obey thou shalt not kill. But here is the ordinances or uh, what was applied to the law, what it meant that you had to follow. Okay, that's just how deep the law was. It isn't to say thou shalt not kill. They had uh, details of what that meant, and you had to follow according to those details. Okay? If I can say it that way to kind of break it down. That's, why, that's how hard the law was. It's just not saying, you know, um, thou shalt not have no other gods. You had to follow the requirements pertaining to that law, what that law meant. No graven images. You can't do all that. So it gave a breakdown of what that meant. And they had to follow that. But it says here, having forgiven you of all your trespasses, your violations, having wiped out the handwritten of the requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way and have nailed it to the cross. He's nailed it to the cross. Your generational curses is nailed to the cross. All of your sins, all of your trespasses, all of your mistakes is nailed to the cross. Christ died once and for all for all things. I testified, I test on it Sunday. Those generational curses that we as preachers or teachers, you, you know, you got to break those generational curses. That was broken on the cross. There's no way in the world Jesus goes to the cross and your generational curses ain't broken. No, we have to, through Christ, now that he has set me free, I have to break the generational patterns. I have to stop doing. You can break the generational patterns. The curse has been broken. It's the patterns. You can break the pattern. If your great-grandfather was a drunk and a whoremonger, and then your dad was a drunk and a whoremonger. Now that I'm born again, that curse is broken. Now I just don't follow in the pattern. Nobody want to teach it like this because you want to try to keep people in bondage. I'm not in bondage. I am set free. So I don't have to be like my great grandfather. And if he and if he was a whoremonger and a drunk, and my dad was a whoremonger and a drunk, then guess what? I don't have to follow the pattern of being a whoremonger and a drunk. Now that I'm in Christ, I'm set free from that. It's time to liberate people and teach them the truth. I'm not under no generational curse. The blood took care of that. So I'm telling folks they're under generational curse. No, I'm not. I am set free. Now, if anybody is under a curse, it's because of your your mindset, you have not been renewed or you have not been uh, under good, solid teaching. Them curses have been broken. You just got to stop the pattern. Amen? I'm going to keep preaching that. I'm going to keep telling y'all this. I don't, care what, I don't care what preacher, your famous preacher, talk about generation. I don't care who it is. That curse has been broken on the cross. Now you have to come under subjection and obedience of the Holy Ghost. And, and, and it tells you that if you obey uh, the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what, What's that, Galatians 5, 16? He says if you, if you obey the Spirit, you won't give in to the lust and desires of the flesh. You won't give in to that generational thing. That, you won't give in to that. How is it that my... That, 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 
My, both my parents were smokers. How is it I accept Christ? I've never smoked. I never drank. Yes, it's by choice, but the Holy Ghost helped me not to fall, to break that chain. I'm trying to help somebody on today. That's by choice, but the Holy Ghost helped me. You're going to get set free one way or another. So here it is. Paul says, page 126, last paragraph. Paul says that through the death of Christ, God wiped out the handwritten of the requirements that was against us and took it out of the way. Paul does not speak about wiping out of sin, but the wiping out of the requirements. These words better be translated ordinance. These ordinance are ordinance of the law that stood between God and those who transgressed. And therefore, they have been taken out of the way before God could bestow mercy and forgiveness upon us. So we cannot be under the dispensation of grace until God removed the ordinance, the requirements that we had to follow. With the law, you just didn't follow just what the commandments say. There was ordinance, that was the word I wanted, that you had to follow. So when Christ dies on the cross, he sets us free from all of this. Because we could not fulfill the law. We couldn't just not only not only just obey what the commandments said, but the ordinance that was with it. We didn't follow through with that. We couldn't. So he wiped it out. So if God, if Jesus wiped that out on the cross, just imagine, anything you can imagine has been wiped out on the cross. Last paragraph on page 126, small paragraph. That this wiping out includes the Ten Commandments is confirmed by Paul later in the same chapter. Therefore, let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding festival or a new moon or Sabbath. These are things that they kept during the law, the different festivals. The Jews had to follow these laws and festivals. And Apostle Paul, he says, now he's talking about the Christians and those who by faith are believers. He says, do not judge the brethren based upon your food or drink. You know how we get, oh, you ain't supposed to eat no pork. That, 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 that's, that's those who try to follow the law. You still under that bondage of the law. I understand that pork, that pig is not healthy for you. But the Bible does tell us that I can pray over those and eat. The problem with us is that we don't have control. We don't have discipline. Okay, I'm not condemned by what I eat. The ceremonial part of the law is done away with about what's clean and unclean. If I'm correct, not to go down this way, but even the prophet Elijah was fed by a raven, and was not he an unclean animal? <laughs> but I can go there today. I'll leave that alone. Let's deal with the religious observations. We observed them, the Sabbath, the practice. The Jews had to honor the Sabbath day. It wasn't for the Christian. We didn't have a Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was for the Jews. It's according to the law. Now, I honor the Sabbath day, but it's my choice. But I understand my freedom in Christ. Paul says, I became all things to all men. Paul understood his freedom in Christ, but he says, to try to win the Jews, these who are still following uh, the law, he says, I became all things to all men. I followed the law with them, hoping to win them over. So he became all things to all men. Because Paul understood his freedom in Christ. Now, I can also say when the Sabbath day was established, it was before the law. But it was also implemented in the law, and the law was for the Jews. It wasn't for the Christian. 
All right? That's why it's different from Jewish and Christians. Two different things. I don't have to follow the guidelines of the Jews. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I'm Christ-like. All right? Christian new church age. Got to keep breaking it down like this so y'all can get it. It tells us, next paragraph under the Colossians, second chapter, verse 16, the word therefore at the opening of this verse indicates a direct connection with what had been stated two verses earlier. That is the wiping out of the ordinance of the law through the death of Christ. Watch this. Again, the mention of Sabbath at the end of the verse indicates the religious observations or observance of the Sabbath day was included among those ordinances that have been wiped out. Yet the commandment to observe the Sabbath day is the fourth of the Ten Commandments. This, this indicates that the Ten Commandments are included among the totality or, or totally of ordinance of the law that have been wiped out and taken out through the death of Christ. This confirms what we have established. The law, including the Ten Commandments, is a single complete system as men as means of achieving righteousness. It was introduced as a single complete system by Moses. And as a single complete system, it was done away by Christ. So it, the law came in through Moses, but the law was done away through Christ. All right? Came in through Moses, but done away. Now, when Christ did what he did on the cross, the scripture supports it. For he himself, this is Ephesians, second chapter, verse 14, 15. For he himself, Christ, is our peace. We're at peace with God. When we accept Christ by faith, we are at peace with God. Before, we were enemies to God. Now, by faith, I am at peace with God, but through Christ, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of division between us, having abolished, abolished means to do away with, to put an end to, in his flesh, the enmity. That is the law of commandments contained in ordinance, so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace. So the law has been done away with. Christ came on the scene. We no longer have to abide by the law. So abolish means it was no effect. It's done away with. Our next paragraph, and I'm going to be done. Yes, I got five minutes, I'm going to be done. Paul here tells us that Christ, through his atoning death on the cross, has abolished. That is to make of no effect. The law of commandments. He has therefore taken away the great dividing line of the law of Moses that separated the Jews from the Gentiles. See, the law, the only way the Gentile could be a part of the law, he had to be circumcised. So when Christ did what he did on the cross, he, he done away with all that. So now there is no separation. Scripture talks about whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or whether bond or free, whether barbarian or Scythian, I just read the scripture today. This is all have an opportunity to salvation. At one point in time, it was the Jew, Jews, God's chosen people, that was to, uh, to, to spread the gospel. But they were in disobedience. So Christ, once he fulfilled the law on the cross, now salvation is for everyone. Okay? For everyone. Last scripture and I'm done. 1 Timothy 8 through 10. The scripture reads at the bottom of page 127 and I'm done. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless, for those who don't like to obey laws. And insubordinate. For the ungodly, for the sinner. That's who the law is for. For the unholy, for the profane, for the murderers of fathers, the murderers of mothers, the, the manslayer, the fornicator, the sodomites, for the kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, 
That's who the law was for, for those who keep breaking it. I don't need the law if I have the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not going to go against the Word of God or God himself. So I'm going to stop there. We will pick up on page 128. We'll do 129. We're going to transition into chapter 15. 128, 129, we're going to transition into chapter 15. I pray that this teaching has opened your eyes that what Christ did on the cross, we're no longer under the law. We're in a dispensation. We're in a time period, dispensation, time period of grace. We're not in the dispensation of the law. The law was for the Jews. The Sabbath day was for the Jews. It's not for the Christian. Okay? we got to understand the difference. Everything is Jewish. is not Christian. Okay? We try to smash it together. And some of you have been living in error. Been living in error. But I'm praying that those who may watch this video and have tuned in today have um, heard some truth. I pray that you've heard some truth. I pray that you have received the truth. Continue to study. Like I said, you can look Romans 5th chapter, Romans 6th chapter, Romans 7th chapter, Romans 8th chapter. Um, I think even in the book of Hebrews, um, might be around the 9th, 10th chapter. It talks about the law. It talks about grace. If you're in Christ, you're under grace. Okay? So I want to make these things clear. So God bless you. We will have our extra Bible study this coming Thursday at 5 p.m. Feel free to tune in live. Uh, we thank you for tuning in. Pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. Wanted to shed light on truth um, on this afternoon that the law was for the Jews. Okay? And I wasn't trying to attack the Hebrew Israelites, those who claim to be the chosen ones, but they only study the Old Testament. They try to use all the Old Testament scriptures. This is what we got to obey. This is what we got to. And they're just in error. And as born again believers, the Bible tells us we can't be fighting and arguing with folk like that. We pray for them, encourage them, uplift them, but we're not going to fight with them. They, they're going to believe what they're going to believe. Okay? But you need to study the Word of God to know the truth for yourself. We talked about the truth, but you have to be open to receive the truth. So God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Pray that you are blessed. Um, feel free to sow a seed if you desire to. But then also, uh, I think I put my um, my YouTube page. Please subscribe if you have not subscribed. All of our teachings, all of our um, services are on my YouTube page. You don't always have to go on Facebook uh, to see our services. But God bless you. Have a blessed evening. I will see you Thursday at 5 p.m. God bless you.